All right, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to the river. Welcome online, wherever you are, whenever you get this <laughs> message. But thank you for just joining us today. Uh, thank you for the worship this morning. I didn't pick the songs, Cassandra did. It falls in line with the message, so it's awesome. And I didn't kind of coordinate it with her, it just happened. Jed, I want to thank you for uh, just serving last week and sharing the word. Thank you for making this into a sermon series, <laughs> right? Because it started out with grace and you added to it, and today I'm adding to it, right? So last, the week before, we, we speak of Greek gifts of grace, and last week Jed shared on grace anatomy. And today, I want to just talk about an invitation to grace. Have you guys ever been invited to something? You get, a, you get a card, an invitation, right? And then that card is like, sometimes it's all beautiful or something. You know, you look at a wedding invitation. Sometimes on a wedding invitation, is there a theme? You'll see a theme or whatnot. Or sometimes you'll just get a blank invitation. Come here and RSVP, Right? And, you know, and then and there, the invitation also informs us of some practical details, right? Like where it is, how we get there, all of those things, right? Maybe to bring something, maybe not to bring something, right? And the, the invitation, it should be a, a part of the event, right? That brings in excitement, right? It should bring in excitement, Right? It's like, yeah, these people are getting married, or they're having a baby, or there's a banquet, or, you know, whatever it is, right? But it should set the tone of the event, right? And it should. It should set the tone for the event. And for myself, like, have you ever had an invitation where you've had several come at once, and they're like, bang, 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 right? It's like, whoa, like, day after day after day, or... Or even a fact, maybe they're the same day, and then it's a really hard place to be where you have to make a choice, right? Like today, I have to be in three places, <laughs> right? So I, I got to be here, and then I have something to do right after this, and I was supposed to, I was invited to something else, and I had to go here. So I, I sent my wife as my missionary out in that other one, but it was great. But normally when you get an invitation and it's not detailed out, you, what's first things you think of? What do I bring? What do I wear? Am I even able to respond to it? Right? Right? Because we are, we're invited. So I want to go to, in Luke, if you go to Luke 14, right, I'm going to really share part of the scripture to you, with you. But in Luke 14, there's an invitation that comes in this piece of scripture. But it comes after there's a bit of commotion. They're already at a banquet. There's commotion going on. And it's where Jesus was sitting with the Pharisees. And they're arguing about who gets the best seat at the table. And they're arguing and they're commoting, there's commotion and, and all of this stuff. And Jesus rebukes them and he's like, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. But then he says this and then he gives this parable. He breaks into a parable. And I love how God does that. I love how Jesus just broke into a parable because it's an illustration. It's a practical illustration. Right? It's a practical out illustration. And so that's what it is. It actually becomes this place of an invitation to grace. I'm echoing a wee bit. So let's go. Turn to your Bibles. Open up Luke 14, 15 to 24. Okay? If you have your Bibles with you. If not, I have it on here. Okay? So when, are those, one of, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, 
Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still, another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported to his master, then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. You see, God puts out an invitation in that place. And you see, the nature of God's invitation is broad, it's free, and it's ample. So God's invitation is a broad invitation. Right? In verse 16, it states that he invited many. Many. Right? For that imagery of that parable, many who were first invited referred to the Jewish religious leaders of the day. Right? And they had the privilege of reading the scriptures. They studied Moses' Right? With the prophetic message of Jesus coming, and we're entrusted with the oracle of God. Right? And when their dinner hour came, God sent his messenger, John the Baptist, to say that everything is ready now. The Jewish leaders made excuses and did not come. So God expanded it outwardly to the outcasts of Israel, right? Which would have been the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and other notorious sinners, right? What happened? They responded to Jesus' invitation. They responded. You see, and then the master is not satisfied with a partially filled banquet hall. He wanted all filled. Right? It was for everybody. It was for everybody. And you see, God's invitation, it's a free invitation. What do I need to bring? Right? When we get invited to something, first question we usually ask is, what do we need to bring? Is it a potluck? <laughs> right? It's not a potluck, it's a banquet. I want you to understand that. It's not a potluck, it's a banquet. Our pride tells us we will bring a dessert <laughs> or a salad. But Jesus says, no, I provide it all. Just come. I provide it all. Just come. And all you need to do is bring an appetite and come. It's totally free because the host picked up the tab. We talked about that, the gift of grace. And then last week, you know, Jed shared a bit of that. You see, this is such a, a beautiful example of the gospel invitation. Right? But it's one of the most difficult to accept. It's one of the most difficult to accept because they, that means that they can't take any credit for them, themselves. 
This almost goes back into my first message. But it's very true. If we can come and eat freely, right? If we come and eat freely, and we don't offer anything into it, or we, we want to offer something into it, right? You see, the Pharisee sees that as an offense to their dignity and their pride. Right? It looks like an offense to their dignity and their pride. And there's one way that God offers his salvation. He pays for it all. He pays for it all. And all you have to do is what? Receive it freely. Freely. Any other way would bring glory to man. Any other way brings glory to man. His way brings glory to him and his grace. His grace. And it's an invitation of grace. It's undeserved. It's unmerited favor. And it's kindness. You see, this invitation also comes with a warning. For those who refuse it, who approach the wedding feast unworthy, See, grace is a free gift, but it comes with an awesome responsibility, and it keeps on giving. Grace is a gift that keeps on giving, right? And as Jed was sharing last week in that grace anatomy, right, it's, it's grace that plays. But you see, that, that invitation is ample. It's ample. Verse 17 says this, he come... He says, come, for everything is now ready. Everything is now ready. Can you guys say everything? Everything. Come on, church. Everything. Okay. That means all you can eat and more besides. <laughs> he makes all the necessary provisions beforehand, and he puts them on the table. That means, look, a full buffet. How many of you guys like buffets? Come on. All right. All you can eat. Right. Okay. And you see, it's loaded with appetizers. <laughs> Soup, salads, every kind of choice meats. Everything you can imagine. Even tops it off, and Don's not here, but with an amazing array of every type of dessert imaginable. Right? Don won't even go for the, the big meal. She'll just go for the dessert side. That's okay. Right? But doesn't that paint an amazing picture of abundance? An amazing picture of abundance? <laughs> of the salvation of God that he freely provides for us. Right? And not that we just go at it with gluttony, but there's so much there. And there's something for everybody. Literally. Right? And when you come to this table, he doesn't just give us bread and water. He gives us abundance. He gives us the works. The full measure. Right? And he is, he's the fountain of living water to wash away all your sin. But look at some of those responses to God's invitation. Some refuse it with excuses. While others accept it personally. Remember, excuse me, I cannot come. Excuse me, I cannot come. I hate to say this. <laughs> But in all the lame excuses of the original guests, don't you think those were shallow? Think about that for a minute. Think about the shallowness of this. We may be able to conv convince others that what we're doing is noble, but I'm afraid that too often our excuses are an insult to God. And I say this, right? Because he's the host and he's the master of the house. Amen? He is. It's God's mercy that we are not consumed. By his, we've been learning that in men's group, right? We know that. This is what he's been speaking to us. 
right? You see, to ignore or postpone responding is plain and simply refusal of the invitation. That's what it is. It's a refusal. It's because the table is ready now. And then those seats may fill up and the doors close. Right? Just take a look at the excuses. And I'm not sure what they were really thinking. Think about this for a minute as I'm, as I'm going through these. No one buys land without looking at it first. Who buys land without looking at it first? Think about that. Right? And same for the oxen. Right? You don't just buy cows or whatever randomly. You look at them. You inspect them. I need to check out my house. Right? I don't buy a house without checking it out. Or hey, you know what? Let's compare this today, today, right? You don't buy a new tractor without trying it out or taking it for a test drive. Hey, Everett? <laughs> right? You don't. Right? And you buy it, and yeah, you might be excited because you want to go put it out on a field and really give her with all your machinery, but is that really an excuse? Is that really an excuse? And honestly... What really would hinder a new couple from coming to a banquet? Think about that for a second. A married couple coming to a banquet. What would hinder them? Right? None of these excuses are sinful in and of itself. Just so you understand that. There's nothing wrong with hard work or having things or marriage for the love of family either. Right? But if they hinder us from coming to the table, then they are then they are. And that's what this parable reveals. It's the insincerity of the part of those that were invited. The insincerity of their heart. Here's the interesting thing. So the ones that came, think about this now. The ones that came, they actually had legitimate excuses. I want you to think about that for a second as I reveal this out. They actually had legitimate excuses. Right? The poor man. I don't have any clothing to wear for such a feast. Think about that. He's poor. He's destitute. He's probably really stinky. His clothes are probably half off. Right? And if this banquet is a fancy feast, he doesn't fit the bill. It's a formal thing. Right? Think about that. He doesn't fit into that place. What about the poor man or the crippled man? I don't have anybody to carry me there. How does a crippled get to the banquet? I don't have anybody to carry me there. But yet he made it there. What about the blind man? What about the blind man in this parable? I cannot see to find my way. I don't even know where to go, how to get there. I've never seen it. I've never been there. But yet he made it. He made it. What about the lame man? Right? He's lame, right? It hurts so much that when I walk on my bad leg, I can't get there. But yet he made it. And then the derelicts, right? Same thing. No, they've been out in the whatever, homeless, however it is. Because it says... I will go out to the streets and gather them. But they still offered. They accepted the offer because they had a need. They had a need. And when they said, yes, I'll come and... They found a feast. <laughs> and that feast was far better than anything they could ever imagined or expected. Amen? Amen. They really did. How do you respond to the RSVP? Right? I know a lot of us have already accepted that RSVP. And that's awesome because that is coming to the table of the greatest banquet.
And those blessings are available to anyone who comes to Christ crossed by faith. Romans 3.24 says this, and all are justified by faith. They are all justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And then Romans 5, 1 and 2, it says this. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And then Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin. Romans 5.15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died for the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus, Overflow to the many. You see, that invitation is broad. It's ample and it's free. And for those of that have responded, he keeps asking us to keep come to the table every day and sup with him. We have that place he's already drawn us in and if you don't know him in that way he's calling you in that place he's calling you to that banquet a banquet in the upper room with him it's a special place that's why God affirms us in those in those places in Romans especially in a time where we're maybe wrestling with our identity the enemy's trying to steal our identity Right? He's trying to tell us, put us back in the place where I'm putting you back out in the streets. I'm putting you back as, as a cripple over here. But God invited them in and they accepted that. Right? They accepted that. And it brought them into a place where we get to have that relationship with Christ. The deepest relationship. And we need to be reminded of that daily of who we are in Christ. Because if we forget, we get stuck back <laughs> in places that we were meant to be free. The Pharisees got stuck in that place where they, they got stuck here. And God, <laughs> in Jesus, <laughs> showed them, here's the banquet that you're missing out on. And in fact, if you really <laughs> if you really know the, 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 the story when Jesus uh, came to oh, what's his name? Uh, the Pharisee I'm losing it. Nicodemus, thank you. Jesus gave Nicodemus the same invitation. But Nicod here's the thing. Nicodemus knew Jesus was absolutely Jesus. He knew that he was God. He was a son. And what did Nicodemus say? I can't do that. There's a, there's a very powerful piece in there. Jesus says, I invite you to come. I'm the way. And Nicodemus knew who Jesus was. In his heart, he knew, he knew, he knew. He knew that he knew that he knew that he was Jesus. But he chose his life of where he was over following. 
I'm sure Jesus wept after he left that meeting. Right? There's no record of it in the Bible. But I'm sure that in Jesus' heart, he wept. He mourned. And he does that for those who don't accept the invitation. Right? Because he comes so that none shall perish. You see, it's on that cross that Jesus carefully counted the sin of all mankind upon himself. He weighed that measure. In fact, he said, he knew what that measure was going to be. In fact, he said, God, if you can take that cup from me, please do it. But if that's your will, I will do it. He says that three times. But if it's your will, I will follow your will. And he knew what was coming. He knew that was coming. Right? Not counting our sin against us, that he took our sin. But rather, God is extending this invitation, that same invitation to all mankind. Do you get that? To receive the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. To receive him in faith. Right? <laughs> Through grace. Through grace. As our Savior and forgiveness of sins. And he extends that invitation for eternal salvation. We had a discussion in men's group what we think eternity looks like. I put one grain of sand on every piece of the ocean floor. Think about that. And beyond, and beyond, and beyond. Think about that. Because here's the thing. God has your name written. He has your name written in the book of life. His name written in the book of life, which is an open invitation that's waiting for you to accept Christ. And that is the grace invitation with your name on it. Amen? Right? And so if you've been saved, you already know your name is written on that invitation. You are there. God asks us, will you come to the banquet? Will you come to the banquet to be what he created you to be? To be whole, perfect, complete, and holy. In this life, we will never be perfect. I hate to tell you that, sorry. We try to attain perfection, but we will never get there till we get home. Then we will be made perfect. Amen? That is the hope that we have. That's why we endure and persevere through suffering and all of these things. Because that is the hope we look for. That is the prize at the end of the gold where we receive a crown of life. Eternal life. If we take our eyes off the prize, we get we get battered up more, right? As Jed said last week. That's what he shared last week. You see, we're also to be in that place free. <laughs> free from sin. Free from guilt. Free from shame and condemnation. Romans tells us, Therefore is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Who is the accuser of the brothers? The enemy. And what does he tell you? You're not good enough. He, and he tries to smash you down. You use that word. Therefore is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Get behind me because it is written. Amen? Right. And also to be loved, accepted, secure, and confident. And when we have that confidence, we're at peace. Right? We're at peace. Last week we were at AMP. Uh, that's where we were. We were at AMP. We were at an equipping and stuff like that. And I was doing some mentoring. And Cassandra was doing some training. And there was one fellow that was there. 
that he's a lifelinks leader. He's this amazing apostolic, prophetic, supernatural teacher. And there's something that sets him apart from some of the other leaders. And I hope to bring him down here because I know he, he, there's something in his heart he gives from the overflow of the Holy Spirit. And I'm God, what does he have that maybe I feel I don't have, right? Not that I'm seeking his gift, but there's something there about him that makes him different. And when he was sharing part of his um, teaching, I learned what it was. God showed me. He is absolutely confident in who he is in Christ. Absolutely confident. And he comes from there, and it comes from this place that just exudes out, and, you, and, he, and he pours it out into you, and he draws it into you. And what's really cool is that actually he was also teaching us on mental health. And in that place, it was this place of filling. It just, he just fills. Because it comes from that place that he knows who he knows, who he knows who he is. Even when he's struggling. And he's like, God, I want that. I want to be like that, right? And so what is God doing? He's teaching us to be confident in who we are. Because that's where we have peace. That's where we have rest. Confidence in who we are. So if we already know Christ, Christ is drawing us into that deepest relationship, and we stand in who we are, amen? Yes. You guys know what a banner is? A banner is something you place in the ground as, as, as somebody you stand under, right? It's a, it's a place of victory. <laughs> you see, it is an invitation to grace. And when we stand under God, we stand in who we are under Jesus, there is grace given to us. There's grace given to us. There's grace extended to us. Song of Solomon 2, verse 4 says this, and this is from the ESV. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Amen? Keep that in your heart. His banner over me was love. You see... Jesus is saying to each person, no matter how great your sins, wherever you are, no matter what you've done, come just as you are. Just as you are. He'll meet you, and he says, come, because I've, come, I've prepared everything for you to be saved from God's judgment and to dine with me for all eternity. Will you say yes? Will you say yes, Lord, I will come? Will you say that? I will come. Do I get to use it yet? I'll cue up some music there, right? But um, who does? Today, I invited several people that are broken and hurting to the church. And I love them. I don't even know them, but I love them already. And it was hard because I'm preaching about excuses. And we can find all kinds of excuses to not come. But I know that God works in our hearts and he keeps working in our hearts and he's going to keep working in our hearts and he's going to keep working in your heart because he's going to draw you closer and closer and closer to him until one day you say, okay, I take the, I'll, I'll accept the invitation. Right? Because that's what he's doing. He's gathering from the streets. He's gathering from those places. He's gathering from all over the place.
to draw him to himself. Right? He is. And if that's you today, right? Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you do know Jesus. First off, if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, just ask Him to draw deeper to Him. Draw deeper to Him. Right? It's, it's a relationship, and a relationship is two ways. And increase it. Talk to Him. Pray to Him. Read your scriptures because Jesus tells you who you are. He wants that relationship. He tells you who he wants you to be. And if you don't know him today, right, wherever you are, if it's here or wherever you are, he's calling you to him. He's calling you. He says, come. Come to my banquet. Come to my banquet. I'll meet you where you are. I love you. Come to know me. And then he says, ask for forgiveness. Ask me into your life. <laughs> Ask him to make you whole. To make you clean. Ask him to make him Lord of your life. That's why he's calling you to the banquet table. And ask him for eternal life. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you invite us to this table. <laughs> it's totally free. And although we're not worthy, we just thank you that your amazing grace is yet to come. We just want to thank you for your love, your grace, your abundance. Thank you for our church, our leadership, our fellowship. Lord, as we go into this week, we just pray blessings into it. We thank you for your son's sacrifice that we are truly free. We pray that in Jesus' name. And now we get to do something even more incredible. We actually get to put that into action.